In today's video, we start our discussion of the history of orchestration. We'll be tracing the art of orchestration from Monteverdi to Mozart in this video. What is orchestration? Well, the orchestration is the art of arranging instruments to musical material, assigning each instrument or group of instruments to a specific musical passage. The art grew as the orchestra did, first following vocal polyphony, then to the more organized inventions. The art of orchestration has changed as the instruments of the orchestra did. With technological improvements in individual instruments, there was more invention in the orchestral writing. Let's start off our journey with the brilliant mind of Monteverdi. For most of his life, he wrote vocal polyphony in the form of madrigals for four to eight voices. He published them in volumes named books, with each one of them becoming more and more complex. He created something called the solo madrigal, or monody, where one singer would sing accompanied by a continuo section, or keyboard, bass, and cello. In his opera L'Orfeo, he combines his writing of polyphony with a solo madrigal to create something new and daring. Orchestrations at the time were limited to monody and vocal polyphony played by instruments. No use of independent sections in the orchestra for harmonic or coloristic effects. There was no orchestra, just a conglomeration of instruments put together to make a pickup band for individual performances. Orchestras of the period had string parts, harps, lutes, and keyboard instruments in the basso continuo section. The strings had violins and viols, a mashup between a violin and a viola, sometimes as big as a cello seated on the lap. Most string writing was done in five parts, two violin, two tenor violin, and bass. Monteverdi used all of these in his opera L'Orfeo. Monteverdi did create some new effects with the orchestra for this opera. He is known as the first creator of orchestral effect. Monteverdi started writing indicative parts for the violins in fast runs almost unheard of at the time. He also was the first to use pizzicato for effect, or and tremolo, the repeated measuring of notes. Each of these effects had a dramatic purpose, starting the tradition of more orchestral effects in opera writing than writing for the concert house. Let's take a look at some of his indicative writing of the time with the first ritornello in L'Orfeo. He obviously was writing in the vocal polyphony style. The five parts all have individual melody strains running together and against each other. The strings are playing the notes, but they aren't delineated in the score. This is another indication from the time period where composers would write music that could be played by any instrument that happened to be around at the time. The string section for L'Orfeo consists of violins, viols, and harp. The next time period only draws a little bit forward in the art of orchestration. The orchestra starts to become an organism made up of strings, including tenor violins and cellos, with a few winds, brass, and keyboards added. You can still find lutes in the orchestra as well. It was becoming a more defined body. Composers like Henry Purcell and Domenico Scarlatti drew on the same orchestra for their writing. They began to write for four parts instead of five in the previous generation. Also, string parts started to be written for the instrument in a more native voice with arpeggios and repeated notes. It gave the string orchestra a more string-like flavor. Winds were being used singling and doubling the string parts. However, the parts were contrapuntal to create polyphony as seen in past generations. Some of the inventions were parts starting to purely accompany other parts in the texture of orchestral music. These are the first small steps away from contrapuntal writing to harmonic writing. The the time of Bach and Handel was one of orchestral growth. Most orchestras added transverse flutes and two horns, making the orchestra in Handel's time two flutes, two oboes, two bassoons, two horns, two trumpets, drum, four string parts with the cello and the bass playing together, and keyboard instruments like the harpsichord and a few lutes. This double wind arrangement is standard for today and was in place in Bach's age. Trombones were used only in church orchestras and would have to wait a 
few generations to make their break into the concert house. Progressive composers of the day would use winds in different ways. Instead of just doubling the string parts, they would give them their own material. The advent of more accompanying patterns instead of continuous polyphony was the beginning of modern orchestration. Handel would use two distinct methods of handling the orchestra. One was the old pattern, where the oboes and bassoons would double the violin and the cello parts, playing the same melody at the same time. This was the accepted method of working with the orchestra at the time. The second method places the strings in one group, the oboes and bassoons in another, and the trumpets and the drums in a third. Three trumpets were used, two in the clarino range, very high so they could play chromatic notes, and one, the principal, in the lower fanfare range. Range. These were natural trumpets with no valves, so they could only play open notes. As the notes get higher, there are more notes available to play, which is why the moving trumpet parts are in the clarino or high range. In Handel's Water Music No. 1, you can see two different ways of handling the orchestra. In the overture, Handel doubles the violin melody in the oboes, as it is standard practice of the time. At the Allegro, the concertante, or solo first violin, begins the theme. Then the concertante second violin joins it. When the whole orchestra begins, the oboes join the first and second violins in their parts. The writing is very contrapuntal, without any other textures. Let's listen to that. In the second movement of his water music, Handel uses the new technique of accompaniment, along with using a woodwind as a solo instrument. The strings accompany the solo oboe. Let's hear that now. The next group of composers that evolved the art of orchestration was Mozart and Haydn. The biggest difference between the orchestrations of Bach and Handel and the orchestrations of Mozart and Haydn comes into the handling of orchestral texture. The orchestras went from handling polyphony to accompanying one another in various settings. A little of this could be seen in the previous period, but it really took root with Mozart and Haydn. The gates of modern orchestration opened up when composers began to accompany melodies instead of writing counter melodies. This new scheme allowed one group of the orchestra to provide harmony while the other provided motion. Their orchestral tutti then becomes the winds providing harmonic background as body and cohesion and the strings providing energy and ornament. Pizzicato chords and arpeggios begin to be used in the strings as accompanying figures. Solo parts begin to stand down without the heaviness of contrapuntal forces weighing it down. Composers also started using groups of instruments for their tone color instead of just mixing them all together. The strings began to exploit their stringness in addition of double and triple stops on tutti chords, pizzicato and tremolo, the rapid alteration of notes eased by the new bow that was in style. The music began to be conceived for the orchestra directly instead of as a vocal or keyboard polyphony. The time period of Mozart and Haydn also brought the clarinet into the orchestra. It was named for its sound like that of a trumpet, or clarino in Italian, thus clarinetto, or small trumpet. During the period of accession, the clarinet sometimes stood in for or doubled the oboe. They were not universally played in all orchestras, and then some orchestras did not have them. They figured in most of Mozart's operas, but only five of his symphonies, and are only in Haydn's last 12 symphonies. 
One of the great orchestras of the period, the Mannheim Orchestra, was responsible for the idea of dynamics in orchestral works. They would use crescendi and decrescendi in their performances, making them in vogue around the world. Many other composers would use them in their works after Mannheim. Mozart spent some time in Mannheim in 1777 to 1778, where he heard the famous electoral orchestra play under the direction of Kannenbach. Directly afterward, he went to Paris and wrote his 31st symphony, the Paris Symphony. Let's take a look at it. You can see that Mozart varies how he works with the orchestra in the first few bars. It starts with a large orchestral tutti with all the instruments playing. Then it breaks into a new accompanying pattern with the first and second violins in octaves taking the melody in arpeggios until the winds join them with the entire harmony in large notes. The entire segment gets repeated, then the violas, celli, and basses along with the bassoons take off in a sweep of orchestral motion while the first and second violins have a melody that is supported by various woodwind players. The classical orchestra is in full effect with the new orchestration techniques abounding. For this newly complete orchestra, there were many choices and new freedom in the orchestrations. Composers could group the instruments into these classes. Strings alone, woodwinds alone, woodwinds and strings, horns and woodwinds, horns and strings, horns, woodwinds and strings, woodwind, brass and drums, or tutti. The orchestra was already a three-part body. The strings and the woodwinds were harmonically self-contained. The brass would have to wait for valve horns and the use of trombones to become self-sufficient. The history of the art of orchestration is a long one, with a steady evolution from one style to the next. Each new sound or texture was created by an individual and then was passed around for all other composers of the time period. The journey from Monteverdi's pickup orchestra to the standard orchestras of Mozart and Haydn was a long and torturous one. Not all ensembles in Europe had the same instruments, and the composers had to write for what was available. That is why you see the acceptance of the clarinet come on in a patchwork fashion after its creation. The period of Mozart and Haydn brought about a modern art of orchestration by using accompanying patterns instead of continuous polyphony. The orchestra, as a unit, also emerged in its final form, double winds, horns and brass, timpani, and strings in four parts. It was then the first true symphonists, Mozart and Haydn, could work their magic. The next leap in orchestration came around the time of Beethoven and Weber. The cello started being used in the tenor register up on the A string for brilliant effects. It was soon to be a full melodist or someone who plays the melody. It was freed from the bass part jail and started having more diverse parts instead of just doubling the double bass part an octave above. This growth can be seen in the second movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, where the celli join the violas for the first motive or short musical phrase. Let's hear that now. The timpani also had a renaissance, sometimes playing notes other than tonic or dominant, having a number of different effects attributed to it, including crescendo rolls, use in soft situations, and playing two notes at the same time. Orchestras at the time show appreciation for the value of clearness in orchestration. The tone of each instrument is allowed to be in its native state and accompanied by others whose tone color does not distract from theirs, and various groups of related tone color are freely contrasted as well as combined with another. More care was taken with dynamics or volume, freely employing gradients between pianissimo very softly and fortissimo very loudly. Also, there were more exacting 
directions for the phrasing and tempo in the scores. And opera scores also had more dazzling effects. Weber's Der Freischutz has probably affected the composer's art more than any other work in the time period. Another successful feature of orchestration was the Rossini crescendo, the addition of instrumental groups one by one to create the feeling of a crescendo. The time period of Berlioz and Mendelssohn saw many more features of the modern orchestra come to fruition. The introduction of trombones into the concert orchestra saw the brass segment of the ensemble harmonically complete. The only member of the section not present was the tuba, which would not be added for a few years. Composers of the time understood the orchestra as a three-body system, strings, woodwind, and brass. The string orchestra was in a state of technical flexibility never seen before with the ranges of the first violins and the cello soaring above previous periods. The writing was more chromatic and included new effects like playing sul ponticello or close to the bridge for a whiny winded sound or col legno, the hitting of the strings with the back of the bow. The woodwinds were being used more chromatically as well with more solo sections of a melody doubled at the octave to balance out the richness of the strings. The brass section also made headway with more flexible and diverse horn and trumpet melodies even though they were still only natural horns and trumpets in the orchestra. The independent flame of the period was Berlioz. He brought a new way of orchestrating to the orchestra, depending more on his imagination than on past examples. The possible uses for each instrument, each tone color, and each blend was seen in a new light and weighed with a careful eye. Berlioz also had new ideas in the realm of organization and rehearsal of the orchestra. He insisted on sectionals, or separate rehearsals by sections, was dogmatic in his placement of individuals on stage, Stage and focused on another hundred details of rendering an orchestral performance that were new to the age. His standard of performance was also very high for the time period, leading to some very embittered concerts by Berlioz. He orchestrated with an ear for color everywhere. His string writing combined groups of like instruments into their own choirs, violins in multiple parts, violas in multiple parts, cello in multiple parts, even double basses in multiple parts. As melodists, each one of the string parts shared an equal responsibility and enjoyed equal importance, each type with its own color, individuality, character, and function. Berlioz wrote for the woodwind section with a clear perception of the distinctive tone color, tone weight, and natural character of each instrument. The individual technique of each instrument is kept in view. The outliers of the woodwind section, the piccolo, English horn, and the bass clarinet are also used to maximum effect. The brass section felt his hand most readily as he tried to make the natural horns more chromatic melodists, sometimes by requiring four horns in four different keys for a work. He also used the trombones with maximum flexibility, not just for loud spots, but for soft ones too. The brass parts move independently in his hands, their status as musically equal with the other two groups of the orchestra for the first time. In his time, Berlioz was seen as an outlier, always craving bigger and bigger orchestras. His works were not as seen as immediate runaway successes in his lifetime and did not influence too many of the composers surrounding him. Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique stands as one of his masterworks. We can see his dynamic use of the orchestra at the top of the fifth movement, the Song du Nuit de Sabbat, or the Witch's Sabbath. Berlioz uses many orchestrational tricks to establish the mood at the beginning of the movement. The strings are broken up into a massive divisi, with the first violins in three parts, the second violins in three parts, and the violas in two parts. They all begin the movement with a tremolo high in their range while the celli and the basses have the motive, an upward thrust louder than all the upper strings. The third bar sees the upper strings break out into 30-second three-note pairs, repeating over and over, sounding like something that is creeping slowly towards you. The strings then have descending chromatic sextuplets, landing into a cello and bass sextuplets that sound like growling. Against the rumbling, the strings have pizzicato notes, like droplets through a storm. The low woodwinds and brass then have staccato 16th notes descending into the bottom of the registered. The piccolo, flute, and first oboe 
oboe then have a triplet rhythm that sits high in their registers, like a plaintive call that ends in the portamento to the octave lower. Then, starting with the bassoons and the celli, Berlioz has a rising figure that travels through the whole orchestra from lowest notes to highest notes. It terminates in the upper strings tremoloing again softly. The creeping second note motive comes back, ending in another growl from the celli and the basses. All upper strings play three 32nd notes forte at the end of the bar, landing in a sforzando at the downbeat of the next measure. Then the plaintive cry in the piccolo, flute, and oboe comes back, followed by a very soft horn call. You can see the extended techniques and ranges of the instruments used by Berlioz to create the atmosphere of the movement. Let's listen and watch this section of the score. Mendelssohn was the other pole of orchestration during this period. Not as imaginative as Berlioz, he reflected most of the conservative approaches in Europe called the Gewandhaus School after the orchestra where he was music director for most of his life. He was known for adding to the lower end of the string section by dividing the celli and the basses into multiple parts. His woodwind parts were more than just harmony, but included well-equipped solo work as well. He used the brass section to good effect in soft registers, passing along this technique to other composers. His orchestrations and coloring of A Midsummer Night's Dream in its fairy effects is very picturesque and to the point, and so far-reaching that most other composers of the time period and after would turn to his orchestration when in the realm of the fairy. These fairy effects are heard at the beginning of an overture to a Midsummer Night's Dream. The first instruments you hear are two flutes. Then as each transforming chord changes, Mendelssohn adds instruments to change the tone color. The second chord adds the clarinets, and the third chord adds the bassoons and the horns. The horn color is really pronounced in the fourth chord with the low notes played in octaves. It is in these changing colors that Mendelssohn paints the fairy world. The strings then come in with an E major chord, the key of the work, but then skitter off into E minor, the parallel minor. The dancing of the violins is seen as the dancing of the fairies. The violas come in with pizzicati to enrich the chords of the four violin parts. The winds, minus the oboes, then interrupt for another suspenseful chord which resolves at the downbeat of the next bar, overlapping with the moving violins. This then happens again. The chattering violins are interrupted by the woodwinds minus the oboe before the violins run into the second theme. Let's take a listen to that now. <laughs> 
pioneer in orchestration was Wagner. He turned the art of orchestration on its head and was so polarizing there was a reaction against everything he stood for musically. Importantly, he was also controversial then and now for his deeply held anti-Semitism. His biggest addition to the orchestra was to add to the body of the ensemble by adding instruments. Padding the orchestra started with Berlioz and was taken up by Wagner, who added additional flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, horns, trumpets, trombones, and strings into the mix. He even had his own style of tuba, or the Wagner tuba, join the orchestra. The sheer volume and vertical nature of his harmony, rich in tone from all of the notes sounding at once, means a chord struck by Wagner is completely different from one struck by Beethoven or Mendelssohn. He writes moving parts for the strings when the brass take over the melody, creating a web of continuous movement in the orchestra. He also finally has valve brass instruments, the modern trumpet and horn, take over from their natural counterparts. His brass writing was chromatically complete. The brass section was finally able to take on the responsibility of being melodists, whether a trumpet, horn, or trombone. Let's take a look at some Wagner, an excerpt from the fiery music at the end of Die Valkyrie. The excerpt begins with a blasting melody in the low brass, dominating the scene. The lower strings then come in with finger tremolos, now more in vogue than ever and highly used by Wagner. The horn covers the vocal part in this excerpt. The trombones come once again with the theme. The English horn, bassoons, and horns have a secondary theme while the strings have filigree patterns to fill out the harmony and provide motion. The secondary theme gets handed off to the trombones, then the bassoons and the fourth horn have a cascading chromatic gesticulation that terminates in fast string tremolos and the celli that sound like buzzing. The bassoon and the celli then have ascending chromatic scales that again terminate in the buzzing of the celli, this time with the violas added. The buzzing ascends as a transition to the next section, where the piccolo has straight sixteenth notes against the rest of the woodwinds and horns playing the second theme. The harp joins in and along with the arpeggiating upper strings creates movement for the second theme. You can see how Wagner has a consistent engine of motion, usually using the strings, throughout the whole section. The string parts are dynamic and difficult, stretching the technique of the day. Wagner's use of brass was also a first for his time period. Trombones and horns have not been used this way before Wagner. You can also see the size of its orchestra with four flutes flutes, including piccolo, four oboes, including English horn, four clarinets, including bass clarinet, three tr bassoons, three trumpets, four trombones, including bass trombone, tuba, two harps, glockenspiel, timpani, and strings divided in twos, two first violins, two second violins, two violas, two celli, and two basses. This massive orchestra creates a dense, thick, luxurious sound that is the calling card of Wagner's works. This excess is what becomes the sticking point for the next generation of composers. They either fall in line with it or reject it completely. Let's hear that excerpt of the fire music. Wagner took the musical world by storm. His orchestrations were either loved or rejected by the musical establishment throughout Europe. There were two camps, those that thought the orchestrations and the work by Wagner was the new way forward, and those that completely rejected the Wagnerian model and stuck closer to the orchestration models of the past. 
Wagnerian orchestration was thick, had winds and threes or fours, extended brass, and string parts that used a lot of divisi, or separation of parts. Another feature of Wagnerian writing was the constant movement of all the orchestra parts. Very little of the orchestra was static. There were parts stacked on top of one another, moving in different directions, giving you a sense that the orchestra was crawling forward under its own power. The obscurity of the parts and the size of the orchestra was beyond what some composers could write for. Many European orchestras could not draw on the diversity or number of instrumentalists needed for Wagnerian orchestration. Franz Liszt was foremost among the Wagnerian sympathizers. His success in the concert hall spread the gospel of Wagnerian orchestration to other parts of Europe. Known for his brilliant orchestral effects, most of his Wagnerianisms can be found in his tone paintings. One of the biggest names to reject the sumptuousness and luxury of Wagner was Johannes Brahms. He can be said to have followed the spirit of Beethoven and Schumann in his orchestrations. He loved to split the lower strings, dividing the celli and the basses into many parts, and pairing them with the horns. The upper string parts are always moving, filled with with double stops or polyphonic writing. The woodwinds usually double themselves throughout, with sections taking solos instead of singular instruments. His strings and woodwinds are considered equally powered, passing melodic material back and forth. He uses his brass as if they were in Beethoven's time, ignoring the new valved instruments. Trumpets hardly get melodic or chromatic material, and the horns have short moments of solo that stay close together on the staff. Brahms loves using the strings, woodwinds, and horns as one unit, using this combination as his neutral tone. Brahms also loved to play with meter and set things on different parts of the beat. In some of his compositions, he completely obscures the beat for several measures just to come back to it. The opening of Brahms' Symphony No. 1 is characteristic of his symphony writing. The opening is scored for woodwinds and strings, with the melody in the first violins, second violins, and celli crawling up the register, and the woodwinds crawling down. The beat is obscured in the string parts, while it's reiterated in the repeating timpani pulse. Let's hear it now. extension to the Wagnerian model was Richard Strauss. He brought the theatrical effects of Wagner to the concert hall in his tone poems. He used many effects that were only known as exceptional and belonging to the theater. His divisi in the strings exploded until each desk of two was playing its own part. The growing contrapuntal complexity of Strauss's music required a new idea of what a 2D orchestra sounded like. He would have to double the melody at the octave or in another part to make sure the balance was correct for the work. This leads to some unusual doublings, such as having the trumpets and the trombones double the strings in legato or smooth playing sections so the parts had enough power. Strauss adds multiple contrapuntal interests to create his extended harmonic worlds instead of relying on the backing power of woodwinds, which would be normal for Beethoven or Brahms. Extended techniques like tremolo on artificial harmonics, portamento in both strings and woodwinds, muting for all brass instruments including the tuba, groups of brass given shakes to play, tongue tremolo in the brass instruments, tongue tremolo in the woodwinds, extended percussion including wind machines, cowbells, and others all make an appearance in Strauss's work. Strauss's poem, Till Eulenspiegel's Merry Pranks, is an example of his wide-ranging orchestration. Let's take a look at it. We drop into the piece already in progress, with the winds and strings cascading in undulating runs, ending in trills for the woodwinds. The horns, along with the trombones, violas, and the celli, have a thrilling theme that moves upward before coming down. <laughs> 
The trumpet has a thundering rhythm, giving this a military flavor. The second stanza has the oboes joining in, and there is a switch between the celli and the violins, the latter joining forces with the theme. It terminates in a staccato section that sounds like riding a horse, with pizzicato in the strings and staccato articulations in the winds. The horn plays the till theme over and over. The section transitions to a flute solo, playing wildly while the rest of the orchestra accompanies. The oboes and the horns pass the till theme between them. The strings and the woodwinds layer in to create an orchestral crescendo, dissipating immediately. The celli, basses, bassoons, and bass clarinet have a rising melody, fighting for prominence with a downward figuration in the woodwinds. The orchestra has another huge crescendo, with parts going everywhere, until it conglomerates into four tutti notes, the last one held. This is the zenith of the section. The orchestra then returns to the rollicking horse figurations, this time with the strings arco or playing with the bow. The trombones and the bassoons have a massive upward scale, leading the entire orchestra into a section of chaos, with all the members playing accented eighth notes. This is Till being chased by the authorities. This then leads into a section of martial rhythm, with the overarching horn melody. This is abruptly interrupted by a large tutti staccato chord that leads to a drum roll on a snare drum. Till has been caught and is being led to the gallows. The brass, including bassoons, play dire chords like the charges being read. The strings and the horns come in on the offbeats to add even more sinister flavor. This is interrupted by the D clarinet playing the till theme as if till is trying to argue with the authorities. This then goes back and forth between the brass and their ominous chords and the D clarinet playing the till theme, mimicking an argument between till and the authorities. The last interruption by the till theme is in the highest register of the D clarinet, almost squeaking, illustrating till's rising terror. This ends with a circular motion in the horns, trumpets, and upper strings, like a noose being wound around Till's neck. The bassoons, horns, and low brass play two notes, a major seventh apart, landing on the low G flat as one more final rebuke. The D clarinet plays a longer version of Till's theme, ending up in that squeaky register again. The oboes, English horn, and D clarinet scale down the staff, as if to play out a slow motion fall of Till's body from the platform. The section ends with a few low chords, pizzicato in the strings, as Till dies. Strauss's use of extended orchestral techniques brought the techniques used in opera into the concert hall and used them to tell a complete story. Let's hear that section now. Try to follow the high points of the orchestration as the excerpt plays.
opposite of Strauss during this period was Claude Debussy. Debussy was an impressionist who relied on creating a mood and an atmosphere instead of direct tone painting. You will not find music that correlates directly to action in Debussy's music, unlike what we saw in the Strauss. Debussy's orchestra is wrought in finely detailed tone color, using the orchestra like a painter's palette. Impressionists like Debussy also use harmony as timbre, using new chord combinations, ambiguous tonality, modes in exotic scales, parallel motion, and other effects to generate an overall mood or feeling. Debussy would divide the string group into multiple parts, sometimes playing at odds with one another. One section would be playing muted, another group not. He also used some strings playing pizzicato while others played arco, using the string harmonics to stack chords and the tremolo to create tension. Most of his string writing is not loud but very reserved. The woodwinds speak in thin melodic lines for solo voices, sometimes blended in groups, both overlapping and picking up the threads of harmony or melody, one from another, with carefully concealed joints. He delighted in the tone quality of low flutes and high bassoons, using them extensively in his orchestrations. Brass voices in Debussy's works are often muted and rarely heard at full strength. Sometimes they hold soft, sustained chords for long times. The trumpets are chromatically active, injecting some chromaticism in between melodic groups. The brass as a group just occasionally flares up into brilliance for a moment, perhaps a second or two in the whole work, and then subsides. Debussy also has light touches with percussion instruments as well. He uses hardly audible rolls on the cymbal or light, elusive touches on the side drum just to vanish as fast as they appeared. Debussy's work Prelude à Prés Midi d'Enfant demonstrates most of his striking characteristics at the very top of the work. The work is opened by a famous flute solo, starting on a C sharp and descending a tritone to a G natural. The scale is somewhat chromatic, and the whole melodic cell is in the low range for the flute. Then the oboes, clarinets, and horns come in with a sustained piano chord, while the harp does a mildly discordant arpeggio. The time signature goes from 9-8 to 6-8, shortening each measure, while the horns waffle around a few tones and the harp does another glissando. The strings hold out pianissimo chords, muted. The score goes back to 9-8 when the flute comes in again, with the same melodic fragment as the opening. The strings are all playing tremolo, except for the basses, all sur la touche, or over the fingerboard. This gives the strings a very airy feeling, because the instruments are less resonant when played over the fingerboard. The horns undulate again, and the melody is handed off to the oboe. Debussy then writes an orchestral crescendo by phrasing in the clarinets and the bassoons, having the first violins drop out of the tremolo, and the rest of the strings start playing naturally. As the crescendo awakens, the first violins join the oboes and the clarinets to double the melody in octaves. Once at the forte, WC has the orchestra crescendo in waves, with three eighth notes to a crescendo, dropping back before starting the next crescendo. This creates the sensation of waves breaking on the shore. The orchestra drops out and leaves a solo clarinet to play the melodic material again until it releases into repetition of the opening. This work is totally different than anything Wagner or his contemporaries could write. It is primarily played piano or softly, with a small section forte or loudly, before dipping back to piano again. The tonality is not straightforward, but undulates with the melodic material. Let's listen and watch the opening of this work so we can delight in Debussy's sound world.
The story of orchestration branches off from here. There are many different paths for a composer to take, whether the maximalist Wagnerian style, the minimalist Debussy style, or somewhere in between. The history of orchestration is vast and relied on the composition of the orchestra itself. Orchestras grew from mixed pickup bands with unknown instrumentation to orchestras of great numbers, totaling upwards of a hundred. Every advancement in instrument technology led to new ways to shape and sound the instrument in the orchestra. Each of these instruments went from a one-size-fits-all approach to an individualized approach, where each instrument was used as a color on a painter's palette. Thank you for joining me in this third installment of the History of Orchestration series. I had a lot of fun and learned a lot from putting these videos together, and I hope you have fun and learned a lot too. Please subscribe and make sure you don't miss an upload. You can also support the creation of these videos on Patreon. There's a link in the description box below. The bibliography for this video is posted on my website, dominiqueroyam.com. A link to it is in the description box. Let's continue this conversation about orchestration on social media. You can find me as Joanique Royam everywhere. Thanks so much and see you in my next video.